Section 21 of Astounding Stories 12 December 1930 By Various This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Ape Men of Zlatli by David R. Sparks Chapters 10 and 11 Chapter 10 Kirby, already falling back toward the other girls, caught Naida up in his arms and ran. Nini, he bellowed. Ivana, get the rifles. While the two whom he had ordered sprang to a corridor, and four others followed, Kirby fell in with the others and dropped Naida on her feet. Sick as she was, there was still a ray of hope, because the hard-headed precaution he had taken against treachery this morning was to have Nini and Ivana bring the rifles here and hide them. The first of the ape-men, snarling, laughing, had hopped beyond the altar, and the yellow foam of madness was slavering from his jaws. Over his shoulder he howled some jargon which made his hairy legion struggle to catch up with him. "'Have you got any puffballs?' Kirby snapped at Naida. She shook her head numbly, just as Nini and Ivana swung forward with the manlickers. "'No, but you had sense enough to bring the rifles. Oh, what does it mean?' The Duca has sold himself out to the ape-man. He was helpless against us, and has brought them to destroy us for him. Here, Ivana, give me a rifle, every one for herself." The next moment he had a manlicker at his shoulder. As the thing kicked, an ape who would have reached him in two more jumps crashed over with his heart torn out. The temple echoed with sound which threatened to rip its solid walls apart, and bright flashes at Kirby's right and left told him that other rifles were getting under way. He fired again, twice more, slaughtering an ape with each shot. The five other rifles were creating havoc. Blocked by a dozen torn and bleeding bodies on the floor, the reinforcements which still poured from the corridor began to mill around amongst themselves, and the forward charge slowed down. All the panic which had sent the ape men scuttling from the beach at their first experience of gunfire seemed ready to break loose again now. Kirby felt it was good enough for the work of a minute. "'Get into line as I showed you how,' he shouted. "'Rifles in the front rank, the others behind them. We're all right now. Keep firing.' "'Keep behind me,' he ordered Naida, still unarmed. Then he placed a shell in the chest of one brute who was broader and heavier than the others, a leader, and saw that he had increased the demoralization, and from the hastily formed front rank a volley leaped hot and jagged. Then the rout which had threatened broke loose. As eight ape-men slumped into blubbering, bleeding heaps, the milling remainder of the horde turned, and in a fighting, scrambling frenzy, attempted to get back to the corridor. Kirby let his triumph take the form of thoughts about what he would do to the Duca when that personage could be rounded up. "'Follow after them,' he ordered. "'Don't stop until we have located the Duca. He is the one we must settle.' But he never finished. As he himself— holding fire for a second, prepared to follow up the retreat, he found himself confronted by the utterly unexpected. A voice unquestionably the Duca's began to shout orders at the ape-men from somewhere down the corridor. And riot or no riot, the tones of that voice seemed to inspire the creatures with more fear than the rifle-fire. So suddenly the change came that by the time Kirby flung his rifle again to his shoulder the crazy retreat had been halted and as he fired again the ape-men swung in their tracks and began to charge. There was no time to guess by what power the Duca had turned the tables. There was not even time for orders. Kirby fired twice, knowing that the ape-men had been infused with some spirit which would bring them on in spite of rifle-fire. Naida, unarmed, cried out behind him, and he shoved his gun at her. Take it! He had just inserted a new clip. He handed her others. Fire for your lives! he shouted to the girls. But you, Naida gasped, you are unarmed. I'll be all right. On the floor lay a jagged, hand-chipped knife of obsidian, which had fallen as some ape died. Kirby grabbed it. In another second the flood of ape-men had burst in all its fury over him. Crashing, thundering shots were dinning in his ears. Animal death screams and the Valkyrie and the Valkyrie battle cries of the girls filled the temple. He could not tell how many of the apes were fighting him. As a caveman's club whizzed past his head, he drove his knife once and yanked it dripping from hairy, yielding flesh to plunge it again. A sudden sidestep carried him away from another assailant. He dropped the knife to snatch the gigantic club of one of the creatures he had killed. 
Quicker in every movement than the ape-men, he laid on right and left with such power that blood spurted in a dozen places, and heads were split open on every side, and because of his speed the frantic clumsy blows and knife-thrusts which were directed at him proved harmless. A terrific drive which smashed a snarling face into pulp left Kirby free for a second, and he emerged from the first round of battle ready to cut in and help the girls. But then he saw that he had gotten separated from the main body. "'Naida!' he called. "'Naida!' A series of shots answered him, and as several apes fell, a gap was opened through which he saw her conducting a well-ordered retreat of all the girls toward the dark corridors surrounding the temple. Again Kirby fell to with his club, swinging, hacking, fighting with his whole strength, to catch up. He made headway, and hope began to come again. The ape-men would not kill or even harm the girls. What they wanted was to carry them off. If he and Naida together could get their party rounded up in the corridors, the chances were good. Naida, he shouted again, coming! Battering down an ape in front of him, he jumped up on the corpse, and saw that already the vanguard of girls had reached the first sheltering corridor. Naida had been cut off from the others by eight or ten apes. But even so her fire made her mistress of the situation, and she seemed all right. It was just as Kirby started to jump down from the corpse that he saw something which put another complexion on the matter, and left him frozen where he was. Behind Naida, directly in the path in which her slavering aggressors were slowly forcing her, a huge stone slab in the temple floor had begun to tilt up, as if it were a trap-door raised by an invisible hand. Within the yawning opening, Kirby caught a glimpse of stone steps winding down into blackness. In a flash he saw that it was Naida, and her alone, that the ape-men were after. The Duca's determination was to capture her, and it was the presence of this trap-door making capture possible which had brought on the second charge of the apes. A scream, high and wild from Naida, released Kirby from his trance of horror. He leaped off the corpse and smashed a suddenly presented skull like an eggshell. Momentarily he saw Naida too terrified to fire, staring at the open trap-door. Kirby felled two apes and felt their blood on his arms. Ivana, he yelled. Help Naida, for God's sake! An answering shout, not from Ivana alone, but from many girls, encouraged him, and he swung his club with a speed and force which would let nothing stand before him. But then another scream from Naida rang in his ears. Naida, he shouted, it's all right, we're coming. He knew, though, that it wasn't all right. Fighting like a maniac, he opened another lane down which he glimpsed her. Fighting still, in a last terrific effort to force his way down the lane to her side, he saw the black opening gape at her feet, and as Naida screamed again, a dozen hairy arms reached it at once, twisted the empty rifle out of her hands, and lifted her shining body as if it had been a feather. Shouts and murderous fire were coming from the other girls, and Kirby swung his club as never before, but even as he fell upon the last two or three apes which kept him away from Naida, those who had snatched her bolted down the steps. Kirby was left with the memory of Naida's great eyes fixed upon his, fear-filled, beseeching his protection. In a second the ponderous trap-door crashed into place, and she was gone. CHAPTER Eleven, Dazed and grief-stricken, Kirby stood in the bloody corpse-filled nave of the temple, surrounded by thirty-two girls, whose faces were blanched and most of whose eyes were tear-bright. The fight was over and they were assembled to decide what must be done, but for a time no one spoke. Gaining the trap-door just as it was pinioned from beneath, Kirby had torn at it with bare hands, but that had been hopeless. Then he had begun to fight again, but that had been hopeless also. With howls and screams they started to retreat, and it had not taken Kirby long to find out that every part of their raid had been carefully planned, even to this retreat under fire. Straight into the damp black tunnel which led away from the corridor behind the altar, the ape-men had leaped, and Kirby, in hot pursuit, had heard the Duca's voice driving them on. Too much the soldier to follow in that darkness where the Duca knew every foot of the way, and he knew nothing. Kirby had seen that he must go back to the girls and take stock. Now he looked at the strewn ape-corpses, smelled the corrosive reek of burned powder, and tried to put aside his grief. The Duca, he said at last, must have been planning this with the apes ever since the first morning in the castle. Ivana, Naida's sister, nodded. 
The Duca brought the ape people here, kept them in the tunnel, and then herded them back when their work was done. I suppose it was one of the caciques who opened the door when the time was right. "'Does anyone think we ought to try the tunnels now?' Kirby asked. Several girls shook their heads. He knew that already they felt he had been wise in giving up the pursuit. Ivana spoke. "'If the Duca and his hordes stay underground, we shouldn't have a chance against them. And if they don't, we're better here.' Kirby shot a searching glance at her, somehow sure that her thoughts were running parallel with his. "'You don't think they're going to stay here, do you?' "'No, and you don't either,' Ivana answered. "'It seems to me that they will retreat into the Roro as fast as they can,' Kirby then observed. "'And do you think the Duca and all the caciques will go with the apes?' This time it was Nini who spoke, and with the council so well launched, Kirby began to feel better. I think, he answered Nini, that the Duca has gone over to Zlotli altogether. We fooled him today. Instead of killing or capturing us all, he, he only got Naida. But he won't give up. I think he is taking the apes off to some place from which he can launch a new attack. And we've got to stop him before he is ready to deliver another blow. What do you mean? Ivana now asked. Do you know where the villages of the ape people are? Yes. None of us has been very far into the Roro but I could guess where some of the villages may stand." Silence fell after that, but Kirby knew from the glint in Ivana's eyes and the quick breaths which other girls drew that they understood. "'Ivana,' he said suddenly, "'will you go with me into the rural jungle, and stay with me facing down every danger it may conceal, until we have found Naida and brought her back?' A flush of life crept into Ivana's pallid cheeks. "'Yes!' Kirby faced the other girls, all of them keyed up now. "'Nini, will you go?' Nini, bronze-haired, dainty nymph of a girl, who had yet the stamina of a man, looked at him with brave eyes. Then her hands tightened on her rifle, and she stepped forward. "'When will you have a start?' Ivana asked in a low voice. "'Now,' Kirby answered, and taking up the rifle which lay beside him, the same with which Naida had fought, he looked at the other girls. "'There is not one of you,' he said slowly, "'who would not go willingly on this quest.' But the pursuit party must be small and mobile, and there is another duty. To all of you I leave the care of the castle and the plateau. Take the three rifles I shall leave behind, do what you can to reassure the old people, and hold the plateau safe until we return." A murmur of girls' voices sounded in the temple. Kirby motioned to Nini and Ivana, and followed by a low cheer they moved off together. The night was on them, where they crouched in a cave above a swiftly flowing river. Kirby, rifle across his knees, sat peering out across the black, invisible stretches of the forest. His nostrils quivered to this mingled smells of fresh growth and fetid decay of the grotesque land. In his ears shrilled the creaking and scraping of insects, the flap of unseen wings, the distant bellowing grunt of some unseen, unknown animal. "'I cannot sleep,' Ivana said presently from back in the cave. "'Hush!' he whispered. "'You will wake Nini.' "'But I am already awake,' came her answer. I, "'I cannot forget the white snakes which slid from that tree when you tried to cut firewood.' "'Hush!' Kirby murmured again. "'Presently the moon will rise on the earth above, and light will come here. Even if the jungle is terrible, were you not born with courage? Go to sleep now, both of you, because you must relieve me soon.' As silence fell again, he knew that the real thing behind their nervousness was their ghastly doubt about what the night was bringing to Naida. But none of them spoke of Naida. So sickening were the possibilities that Kirby would not permit conjecture to occupy even his mind, when at length the sound of even breathing told him that Nini and Ivana slept. After a dreary passing of an hour, a faint light grew over the jungle, silver and clear, and Kirby let his mind run back to the two deserted ape-men communities which they had found and searched before dusk sent them to the cave. From the signs of hasty departure, it looked as though a far-reaching order had taken the brutes away from their dwellings, and sent them somewhere. That somewhere seemed likely to be the great central community, which Ivana said was rumored to exist in the far reaches of the Roro. The problem was how to locate the community through the hideous country. But Kirby presently drove the question from his head. Tomorrow's evils could best be faced when Marl dawned. Enough light had grown now so that the swirling bosom of the river, and a strip of sand directly below the cliff in which their cave was set, were visible, 
As Kirby let his eyes wander to the lush growth beyond the sand, he heard something which made him stir uneasily. Some creature which suggested power and hugeness immeasurable was moving there. The brush parted, and he saw plainly an animal with the bulk of a two-story house. On two feet the nightmare thing stood, as lightly as a cat, and then came down on all four feet as it ambled out on the sand, and extended into the lapping river a tremendous beak studded with teeth. A smell of crushed weeds and the musty odor like that of a lion-house filled the night. It was more like a tyrannosaur than anything else, breathed heavily and guzzled in great mouthfuls of water. Kirby sat perfectly still. He hoped the thing would go away, but the tyrannosaur did not go away. All at once it hissed loudly and stood up, its eyes glowing green and baleful, and Kirby leaned forward. From the water was slithering another creature with a gigantic quivering jelly body. Kirby saw to his horror that, in addition to four short legs with webbed, claw-tipped feet, there sprouted from the body a number of octopus tentacles. From the scabrous model of the head, cruel, unintelligent, bestial eyes glared at the rearing tyrannosaur. One of the serpentine tentacles whipped out, slapped against the tyrannosaur's foreshoulder to call forth a hiss and a short bellow. Then other tentacles waved in the moonlight, and in a flash the tyrannosaur was enmeshed as by a score of slimy cables. He was not altogether helpless. Suddenly the steam shovel of a beak buried itself in the jelly body of the water animal, and there spurted out a flood of inky liquid. The water animal emitted a sickening gurgle but the tyrannosaur's advantage was only temporary. Closer and closer drew the ugly, scabrous tentacles. The tyrannosaur never had a chance. Its green eyes flared, the shovel-beak plunged and slashed, but never for a second did the tentacles relax. As Kirby stared, he saw the water animal begin to back up, dragging its gigantic enemy with it. For a second the whole night was hideous with the sound of hisses, gurgles, dashing water. Then the river boiled once and for all, and both animals sank in its depths. Kirby chafed cold hands together and shivered a little, then turned to see if Nini and Ivana had heard the struggle. Fortunately, however, they still slept, and as if this peace which was upon them were an omen of good, the jungle continued quiet for the next hour. Kirby wakened them at last, and after a snatched nap was in turn awakened. The three of them started again when the first glimmerings of dawn came to the forest. Of food there was plenty, fruits which grew in profusion, and some roots which Nini grubbed out of the earth. Having started along the first trail which they encountered beside the river bank, they ate as they walked. Kirby judged they had kept their steady gait for more than two hours before a slight widening of the trail roused him from the preoccupation into which he had fallen. "'See there,' he exclaimed to both girls, and pointed at a grove of trees, with fan-like leaves which towered up to the right of the trail. "'What are those big bundles fastened to the lower limbs?' Ivana glanced at Nini, who nodded as if in answer to a question. "'This must be one of the places where the eight people leave their dead,' Nini answered. "'The bundles. But come over to them.' Kirby forced his way ahead until he stood beneath a huge unsavory bundle wrapped in roughly woven brown fiber, and wedged in a fork between two limbs. Judging from the ugly odor which overhung the grove, there could be no question about what the bundle contained. Nini and Ivana, glancing at the scores of similar bundles which burdened the trees of the whole grove, made wry faces. Kirby slung his rifle in the crook of his arm and nodded toward the trail. "'There must be a village somewhere near,' he said. A mile farther on they found what they were seeking, a colony of seventy or eighty conical dwellings of mud and thatch, which were arranged in a double circle about a central common of bare, well-trodden earth. It took no long reconnaissance to discover that the town was deserted completely of all inhabitants. Ivana beckoned and darted to one of the nearest huts, and Kirby following her, found lying on the uneven earth floor, within, a half-skinned animal which resembled a small antelope an obsidian knife beside the carcass, the disordered condition of a couch of grass, the sour odor of recent animal occupancy, all told their story. The owner left in a hurry, Kirby observed aloud. Nini, who had gone beyond, to a larger hut, which might have belonged to a king ape, called out excitedly to them. A great number of apes have eaten a hurried meal here. Kirby entered the shadowed, foul-smelling interior of the central hut to find her statement true. 
Broken meats, some raw, some cooked, lay on the dirt floor, and scattered bits of fruit were mingled with them. The ashes of a burned-out fire at the hut entrance were cold, but had not been for long. "'Do you think,' Ivana began, "'I think the whole of the Duca's horde came this way, fed, and went on, taking everyone with them,' Kirby finished. "'But which direction did they take?' asked Nini, who was standing at the door of the big hut, and had already begun to examine the crowding, green, inscrutable walls of jungle which foamed up to the clearing on all sides. No less than seven trails wound away into the dark country beyond, and Kirby saw that the question would not be an easy one. Having hastily circled the clearing and peered down one trail after another without finding a clue, he knew that it was the Duca's intelligence which had made the ape people depart without leaving even tracks behind them. He did not like the situation. Well he rumbled to his companions. We may as well take our choice. One chance in seven of coming out right. But the words were hardly out of his mouth before he pulled himself up with a jerk and cursed himself for having given in. Ivana! Nini! Sharpness, a sudden ring of hope, edged his voice. Am I seeing things, or is that? As he pointed to a huge aloe bush down one of the trails to their left, they started to run. Then Kirby knew that he was not seeing things. What his first inspection of the trails had failed to show, he saw plainly now. Tied loosely to one branch of the aloe bush, almost concealed amidst the deep green of foliage, was a bit of white cloth. In a second Kirby was holding out to his companions a tiny strip of Naida's wedding gown. She knew we would come. He stared down the trail with narrowed keen eyes. How Naida had contrived to leave her signal was more than they knew. The fact that she had done so sent all three of them down the trail at driving speed. An hour passed, then another, and the morning which had been barely born when they first took the trail wore on to the sultriness and vast colored light of a tropical noon. Twice the main trail forked, and twice they found an unobtrusive bit of cloth to guide them beyond the works. When the hands of Kirby's still useful watch pointed to twelve, they paused to eat and rest, then they pushed on. Meanwhile, the country through which they passed left Kirby with a clear understanding of why Naida and her people had shunned the rural forest down the centuries of time. Just one thing which stuck in his head was the sight of a small creature like a marmoset, sticking an inquisitive nose into the heart of a sickly sweet plant which resembled a terrestrial nemethy. No soon had the little pink snout touched the green and maroon splotched petals than the plant writhed, closed its leaves, and swallowed the monkey whole. Little squeaks of agony and terror sounded for a moment, then ceased. At mid-afternoon they paused in a spot where a forest of trees with whorled tops were slowly being strangled to death by immense orchids of every conceivable shape and color, and by a kind of creeping mistletoe which grew almost as they watched. Here also the ground was covered with fluffy gray-green moss, which seethed constantly as if it were a carpet of maggots. Both Ivana and Nini warned Kirby on his life not to touch or go near the moss, and a moment later he knew why. From the forest came the flash of a small five-toed horse being pursued by some animal with a hyena head that barked. At the edge of the mossy glade the hyena swerved aside, but the terrified horse plunged straight out on the carpet of moss. Instantly the air was filled with the sound of animal screams and a series of tiny muffled explosions. A cloud of greenish-red mist swirled about the horse. Quivering, still screaming, the animal went down on its knees, and as the reddish-green smoke fell on him and settled, it became a mass of growing moss spores. Before Kirby's eyes the pitiful animal was covered by a shroud of green that spread over him and cloaked him, licking over all with tiny sounds like far-off muffled drums as fresh spore cases developed and burst. The screams died. Even as Kirby drew the girls to him and they passed on, the horse's nostrils, eyes, mouth were filled with choking green moss, and he lay still. On and on, deeper into the jungle Kirby pushed, and never for a moment did his companions falter. But the way was not so easy now, for nerves were jaded, muscles sore, and no human will could have been powerful enough to cast aside the growing fear for Naida. Fear came finally to a head when, toward dusk, Kirby sighted a fork ahead of them, approached it confidently to look for Naida's sign, 
and found nothing. "'Oh, Lord,' he muttered, and realized that it was the first time any of them had spoken for long. "'There must be something to guide us,' Ivana exclaimed as she searched with questing eyes through the swiftly deepening gloom of evening. Nini, making an effort to keep up hope in spite of the paleness which came to her lovely face, darted down both paths, glancing as she went at every bush and shrub. But she returned in a moment, and as she shook her head her great eyes were somber. Kirby grunted, scratched behind his ear. Then, however, he stifled an exclamation and clutched at the hands of both girls. On one of the two trails appeared suddenly in the dusk an ape creature. Kirby saw at once that the thing was small a female, undoubtedly, and that it had spied them and was moving toward them with all speed. And borne in upon him most certainly was the fact that the ape-woman was making signals of peace. In her outstretched hand flickered through the gloom a strip of cloth that was gauzy and white. Again, a strip of Naida's gown. "'If you know any words of her tongue, call to her,' Kirby said sharply. Ivana obeyed. All three of them started forward. The ape-woman, after returning the hail in creaking gutturals, came up to them, and with an unexpected look of pathos and entreaty in her face, began to address the girls with a flood of talk. Word after creaking word she poured out, while Nini and Ivana listened in silence. Finally Kirby could stand the suspense no longer. "'What is it, Ivana? What does she say? Your eyes are lighting up with hope. Tell me.' Ivana smiled and turned toward him, while the ape-woman still looked her entreaty. She says, Ivana announced bluntly, that she and the other women amongst their people do not want any of the girls of our race to be taken by their males. Already the men are quarreling about Naida. They will not look at their own women. Naida told this woman that we would be following, and sent her to lead us to the place where the ape people are assembling. Kirby felt his lips tightening in a grim smile at the thought that jealousy was not unknown even to the semi-human creatures of this nether world. He looked at Nini and Ivana during a stretched-out second. Then he moved. Good, he snapped. We go on at once. That was his only recognition of what was surely one of the important happenings of a lifetime. But for all that, his tired brain, which so lately had felt the chill of black depression, was suddenly set on fire with triumph and thanksgiving. End of chapters 10 and 11